And so we get to chapter 10 of James Stewart's calculus textbook. Chapter 10 is called Differential Equations, which sounds scary, doesn't it? I actually took a course called Differential Equations in college before I changed my major. Uh, I still have the textbook on the shelf. Don't frankly remember much from that course. However, I still have the textbook and who knows, I may torture the world with a set of videos uh, on differential equations before I die. We'll see. Um, you might pray depending on how you want it to end out. But anyway, the first section of uh, James, Stewart, uh, James Stewart's calculus textbook, chapter 10 on differential equations is called modeling with differential equations. You might remember from chapter one, we did a little section on modeling, uh, which is not on the catwalk, not that kind of modeling. Uh, although I suppose there must be some similarity that I won't explore in my mind. But um, the real world is messy. Um, this is something that is, I think it was frustrating to me back when I was a Puritan uh, of math. Uh, but I got over my purest ways and I now accept that the world simply um, is very messy. And uh, therefore we can't, we can often not have an exact equation that gives us the exact amount. Um, in fact, in quantum mechanics, it's all about uh, statistical mechanics. You know, the the probability of a of an average, r rather than you can't you can't even you can't even tell uh, what the position and momentum of a specific particle is. Um, that it may not even exist, and that's the the current consensus. Basically, math when you get this high into the ether. And you know, you're, you're so high in math that you can hardly breathe because there's not enough oxygen up here. You have to start modeling things. And so uh, there's some modeling that's gonna take place in this chapter, and we're going to use differential equations to do it. Now I know what you're thinking. What the heck is a differential equation? Well, a differential equation is an equation that has both a function and one or more of its derivatives in it. For example, f prime of x equals x plus f of x. This equation, it's equation, see it has an equal sign in it, has both a function and the derivative of the function in the same equation. Hold on for the ride of your life. Okay, so this is a differential equation. Now the problem with these are you often cannot solve them neatly. We have to model or approximate them. In fact, the general solutions to differential equations, they're often many and various. I'm not at all looking forward to the next section in this chapter. I'm going to have to draw a lot of little arrows and things probably. Uh, slope fields is going to be the next video uh, in this chapter um, because there are so many possible solutions uh, to certain differential equations. Uh, and so that's very annoying. And, and so computers are, are very helpful with, with these sorts of things. But we're going to use differential equations to try to model um, uh, certain kinds of situations. So what is the solution to a differential equation? A solution is when y equals f of x and its appropriate derivatives can be substituted into the equation and it works. Okay, so let's go ahead and see um, what we're talking about here a little bit more specifically. So one of the examples in this section is population growth. Not a, a subject of particular interest to me yet. I don't know, maybe it'll grow on me. Ha ha ha, population growth, get, anyway, never mind, it's not important. So let's say that the rate of growth of a population is directly proportional to the size of the population. In other words, the more people you have, the faster the population grows. This makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, I had two parents and they all had two parents and they all had two parents. So it seems like if you go back a certain number of generation, we're exponentially growing and that the more people you have, um, uh, the more people are coming in the hospital, so to speak. Now, this is not an exact thing, right? This is, we're, mo we're modeling this because there are other factors, plague, you know, for example. But so, but we're looking, we're looking basically for a situation that's not a perfect exact kind of thing, but that in general, the change of population with respect to time, DPD time, is roughly proportional to the amount of population you have. And so when we have this kind of situation, all we have to do is stick in a little constant of proportionality and ding, we have an equation. Again, this is not a perfect equation, but it kind of, it kind of fits in, in uh, general. So this is a differential equation. Why is it a differential equation? It's a differential equation because we have a function and we have a derivative of a function. And so it's a differential, uh, it's a deriv differential equation. Okay, so now what kind of a more, a more, I mean, that's all fine and good, but what kind of specific equation might model this situation? So what, we're looking for a function whose derivative 
is a constant times itself. Well, how about an exponential function? As it turns out, in the fourth section of this chapter, we're going to find out that that's the only kind of function that can model this kind of a situation. So let's, let's go ahead and, and, and try out this as a possible uh, general solution to this kind of situation. So pop, the function of population per time, um, the amount of population as a function of time, equals some constant of proportionality, capital C, times e, that's uh, uh, 2.718281828, it's a, it's a funding number that's important in math, uh, to the kt, where t is time and k is a constant you know, um, in relation to it. Okay, so let's see if this works. So what is the derivative of this? What is p prime of t? Well, the derivative of this, uh, this is a constant, so it comes out. And then to find the derivative of this, it's going to be the k, the k is going to come out, times e to kt. Um, so if I rearrange this a little bit, switch things out, I bring the k out and the c in, then I have that the, the derivative of uh, the population uh, in relation to time equals a constant times, oop, it's the same thing. In other words, it equals this. Ding! We've, so we've, we've come up with a model that works because with this formula, the derivative as a function of time equals a constant times the original function. And that is, of course, a differential equation because we have two different levels, as it were. We have the original p of t and we have the derivative of it, uh, pre, p prime of t. Okay, now, by the way, if you solve for p at zero, so let's, let's stick in um, t equals zero. Um, then the, it's going to be e to the zero power, which is one, and one times c is c. So at p equals zero, at the initial population, um, uh, at time equals zero, the initial population, we find out that the constant turns out to be uh, the initial population. Uh, and so now, uh, if we're going to do population studies, because we're into that kind of thing, we know that C stands for the initial population. Okay, now by the way, um, the world is messier than that. So not only is that um, as a sign of how not quite accurate what we just did is, um, there's something they talk about called the carrying capacity. There's a, usually a point where population growth levels off. It approaches a, a capacity. You know, there's no more room on the island. You know, if we if we have any more babies, we're going to fall off the cliff. You know, or uh, there just isn't enough food, and so people begin to starve or sickness or, or whatever. So K um, population people who are into this kind of uh, social science uh, talk about K, the carrying capacity. And so basically, our original formula only works if P is small enough. If the population is small enough, then the rate of change of population is roughly proportional. Um, to some constant uh, times um, the, the, the population size. But if P exceeds the carrying capacity, then this is going to be negative because we don't have enough space and so the population is going to decline. Or we don't have enough food or the population is going to decline. It's going to, it's going to level off. And so uh, we have to somehow factor in this, this K carrying capacity uh, into our formula. Um, and there was a guy in the 1800s whose name escapes me uh, who came up with what's called the logistic differential equation, which makes that kind of adjustment. Is it precise? Is it exact? It's not exact, but it works uh, in general. And so you can see that this part of it is exactly what we had before, that the rate of change of the population is equal to some constant of proportionality times the size of the population. But this factor is now uh, entered in, where k is the carrying capacity. So. Um, we can see that there are two equilibrium solutions. What I mean by that is there are two solutions to this where the rate of change of the population is zero. That's when P equals zero. So when you don't have any people, you're not going to have any babies. I mean, I, huh, how does that work? I'm not sure. But I, I think you, if you think about it long enough, you'll realize that if the population is zero, you're not going to have any change in population. So that's one of the equilibrium solutions. The other one is when the population equals the carrying capacity. That's when we've reached an equilibrium. We've, we've reached the capacity of this population. In that instance, then P equals K, K over K equals one, one minus one is zero, wah, wah, and this equals zero. And so those are the two equilibrium solutions because the change in population is zero at those points. Okay, little population. Now to something more to my liking, liking physics, motion on a spring. Do you remember Hooke's law? 
Hooke's law tells us that the restoring force on a spring is negative kx. What does this mean? Well, there's basically, um, you have an equilibrium point for a spring, and if you stretch it, you know, doing, 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 slinky, slinky, you know, but, um, so um, it's negative because the force is always pulling um, whatever the, is the end of the spring, is always pulling it back to the equilibrium point. So x is the displacement from the equilibrium point. So the, there's, a, there's a restoring force on the spring or on a pendulum or on something like that uh, that's always pulling um, the thing on the end of the spring back toward the equilibrium point. Um, and so basically, we have a constant of proportionality k, and we've got an equation, f equals negative kx, right? The restoring force pulling it back to equilibrium equals negative constant times the amount of displacement. Now, here's, here's an interesting thing. You remember Newton's second law, uh, which says that force equals ma. Um, and so ma, the mass on the end of the spring and its acceleration must be equal to negative kx. Hold that thought. What is a? a is acceleration. And we know from our math and our physics that acceleration is the second derivative of displacement. So displacement is x. The derivative of displacement, displacement per time is velocity. Um, that's the first derivative. And then the second derivative is velocity, change in velocity per time, which is acceleration. So we can now cook something here. We've got the ingredients. Let's, let's, let's do some cooking. So ma equals negative kx, right? The restoring force equals mass times acceleration. And acceleration is the second derivative of x. This is, is what's called, for the first time ever, a second order differential equation. Because we have a function x, and then we have the second derivative of the function, uh, d2x dt squared. OK, I guess that's how you say that. I don't remember. I used to know. But I'm going to say it that way until someone corrects me. So this is a differential equation. Now, if we were in a physics course, we would go on and say, how can we model this? In fact, I'm sure the book does it somewhere. But what what is a basic, basically, we're looking for some kind of a function that would model the second derivative of that function being proportional to the negative of the original function. Well, sine and cosine do that. Because with sines and cosines, the second derivative is proportional to x, but with the opposite sine. And so uh, what we're getting into is something in physics called simple harmonic motion. It strikes fear into my heart. But I think I'm beginning to understand it. Um, and it is basically based on this modeling. I think, you know, when I first encountered simple harmonic motion formulas, I was really puzzled by it. This is helping me. It's a model. Basically, we're looking for a kind of equation that fits a particular situation so we can model it. It's not a matter of, of, of necessarily strict proof for someone like me, although I'm sure the mathematicians can prove it. Um, but it, it's more of a matter of modeling a situation. Final, final uh, slide, and then you'll be done with me. So initial conditions. As I said, there are often many general solutions to a differential equation, a family of possible solutions, as we'll see when we get to the slope field uh, video that, that is the next in this chapter. But often, maybe usually, we want a more specific solution to a differential equation, one that satisfies some additional requirement. So yes, 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 there are lots of these possible answers, but I want the answer that goes through the origin 0, 0, that kind of of additional requirement. And a lot of the problems you'll have uh, in, uh, in, in the exercises have to do with um, joining a, a differential equation to a specific kind of uh, a situation like that. You know, the, that where, the, where the, the solution to the differential equation that, that has slope 5 at this point, you know, those, those kinds of things. Now, a key example of an additional requirement is when you're looking for the initial condition. Let's say you're doing some physical situation, like population growth or something like that, or, or the motion of something, and you want to know the initial uh, condition, um, where y of t sub aught equals y sub aught. Aught is a fancy name for 0, t sub 0, y sub 0, however you want to say it. But we want to know the initial condition of it, and, and sometimes that helps lock a differential equation out of many possible solutions to ding the one solution uh, that works in this particular uh, case. So that's a key kind of uh, situation where you're solving for the initial uh, condition uh, or, or you're given the initial condition as an additional factor into, into your problem. Um, this sort of a problem is called an initial value problem. 
when you're trying to find the initial value of, of something that is a differential equation. Whew, whew, we made it. Um, I've been sweating this whole video, but we made it. I don't think I've said anything wrong. Um, and so, ding, we're ready to go with differential equations. I think I'm going to like them, uh, although I'm still a little nervous, to be honest.